Hi, everyone. This is America Adapts, the climate change podcast. Trump is the ultimate middle finger to the establishment, including the GOP establishment. And, and that's why he's just, he excites so many that have just been sick of, of you know, the President Bushes and the, <laughs> and the uh, Obamas and the Clintons. I mean, this is just a, it's a great alien life form that has now been foisted upon Washington, and it's fun to watch. Hey, Adapters. Greetings from Boston. I'm on location recording a coastal retreat workshop focusing on indigenous cultures, sponsored by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. It's my first time at MIT. I almost went to school here, except my grades and SAT scores prevented that from happening. But here I am now. I'll have more information on this future episode later. So this is my 97th episode. Some of you might recognize the title, Deconstructing a Climate Skeptic. This is a re-release of the original episode with Mark Morano that came out in August of 2017. It's been over two years since I published that episode. I have several reasons why I'm sharing this episode again. First off, it's a fantastic episode. In fact, in regards to downloads, it's still my most popular episode of all time. Second, it's Climate Week in New York, and there are a ton of events happening around the world. Consider this some counter-programming to all those efforts. Also, my listener base has grown considerably since this episode came out, and not every new listener goes back into the archive. If you haven't listened to this episode, you've probably heard me talk about it on multiple occasions in other episodes. Now's your chance to listen. And for those who have heard it before, you can listen again. Actually, I've heard from many of you that you've gone back and listened to this one multiple times. I just listened to it for the first time in a while, and it was great. I can't believe I had that conversation with Mark. Okay, for those who are even wondering who Mark Morano is, he runs a website, Climate Depot, which is a major climate skeptic website. He has a fascinating history covering environmental news. He worked for both Rush Limbaugh and Senator Inhofe from Oklahoma, which should tell you how he covers environmental issues. The purpose of this episode was not to get Mark on to debate climate change, but to hear what motivates him. Why does he approach the issues the way he does? And then at the end of our conversation, science communicator Dr. Randy Olson comes on and dissects what Mark said during my interview, and we talk about why Mark is so effective, unfortunately, in what he does. Sometimes you have to go behind enemy lines to figure out why they are successful. Mark is a nice guy, but you'll see not doing nice things. But I'll let him speak for himself. If you want to learn more about Randy and the work he does in science communication, I have links to his website and books in my show notes. Stick around until the end where I'll have a new wrap-up to the episode. Most of the conversation holds up, although you'll hear references to some things that have already happened. Two years is a long time in the climate movement. Much has changed, but unfortunately much hasn't. I'm hoping you'll be inspired by this conversation to learn new approaches in communication around climate change. Listen closely to what Randy Olson says at the end. Okay, buckle up again. You're going to need it for this conversation. Welcome back, Adapters. On today's episode, I have a very special and unusual guest, Mark Morano. It's hard to describe everything that Mark does, but he's the executive editor and chief correspondent for ClimateDepot.com, a news and information service he founded in 2009. He is a frequent guest on radio and television in the U.S. and internationally. He's been on CNN, Fox News, the BBC. He's been in Rolling Stone, and he's been in Esquire magazine. Hi, Mark. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Doug. Happy to be here today. I don't know if you know much about the podcast at all, but you are not a typical guest, so I appreciate you coming on. I like being atypical. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's very atypical. And to be quite honest, I've I've followed you for quite a while. I've been in the climate change universe for years, and of course, a lot of us know who you are. And we actually have a common friend, and that's why you're on here today, is in, in Randy Olson. Yes, Randy's great. He interviewed me for his film uh, Sizzle. And I've seen him over the years. I uh, went to one of his actual, appeared at one of his university talks, I believe, up in New York at one of his panel discussions. So I respect Randy and the work that he does and his his openness to alternative views. That's exactly right. Well, he approached me and it's like, how would you like to get Mark Morano on your podcast? And I thought, well, that's not a typical guest, but I'm open to having different conversations. And again, I've, I've followed you over the years and obviously don't agree with a lot of what you talk about. But I, I thought to myself, I can't pass up this opportunity to talk to you about some of these issues. With Randy, I, I'm just curious, did you actually meet him f- as part of interviewing for that movie or did you know him beforehand? No, I, I met him at, when he interviewed me for the film. I was working in the U.S. Senate Environment and Public Works Committee at the time. And he interviewed me right in the committee room, actually, the, the Environment and Public Works Committee room where we held all the hearings. 
as you'd mentioned, Randy is not afraid to be critical of folks. And I mean, sure, he's been critical of you. Is there any anything in particular? I mean, you, you, you produce all sorts of content. He's not necessarily on the same page. But I think that's very interesting, this dynamic of, of you being friends with Randy. Yeah, well, he's uh, actually, I was just talking to Randy about it. His most critical moment of me was he did a review in the New York Times of my film, Climate Hustle, and went after, I guess, the story, the story structure and the camera um, lighting, framing in the film, and really did a, a quite uh, hard-hitting critique <laughs> of me. So he's, he's, yeah, he's not afraid to let people have it between the, between the ears. But you were fine picking up the phone afterwards and talking to him. That's right. <laughs> yes, yes. You are considered, I want to say, one of the most prominent climate skeptics in the media, if not the most prominent. You've, you've been at the center of a lot of these issues over climate change. And so I think even in advance, I'm not here to debate climate change with you. And I, I think you kind of sure. knew that too coming on. It's just, uh, there's really no point. I'm not changing my mind. You're not changing my mind. But I think there's a lot to be learned from how you approach this issue. And so, you know, just first off, why are you a climate skeptic? Good question. Uh I always have considered myself growing up an environmentalist. I was always into nature, animals, my older brothers. We had a, a literally like a pet shop in our basement, everything from caiman alligators to snakes to turtles to lizards to frogs. And I was always out in the woods, always playing them, always. And now I have a, a pet uh, turtle and I have a uh, bearded, my daughter has a bearded dragon, uh, and we have a, just a love of nature. I've always grew up with that. And I remember during the Reagan administration, I was a 12 years old, 12, going on 13, volunteer at Reagan's uh, campaign headquarters in 1980. Wow. So I was followed his administration throughout his two terms. And I remember the one thing I never liked, it was always uncomfortable, was James Watt era, Interior Department. I remember specifically when they were cutting, putting in logging roads uh, out west, and they were cutting the trees down. I was always very, always saying to myself, I'm a Republican and everything except environmental issues. But what happened to me was it was in uh, 1992 when they had the Rio Earth Summit down in, in Rio de Janeiro. And I remember listening to Dixie Lee Ray was a, a nuclear physicist scientist. And she was talking about the Amazon, saying that these scares you're hearing about the Amazon rainforest disappearing, football fields a minute, et cetera, were not true. This was hyped campaign cause. And I remember thinking, like, what is she talking about? And I started investigating that. And it took a few years, but... You know, within by the late 90s, I was doing a documentary called Clear Cutting the Myths about the Amazon Rainforest. And I actually went down to Brazil and I talked to environmental scientists and they were throwing down the guidebook saying this is, you know, bullshit, bullshit. I don't know if you have to bleep this out. If it's no, a podcast. You're fine. But they were, OK, they were saying that the claims that the, that the public was hearing about the Amazon were false. And that truly was an eye opener for me. Uh, and at that point, I was, you know, I'd worked for Rush Limbaugh and I'd covered a lot of environmental marches. Uh, I went to animal rights march and I just started I, I became on the other side of the issue. I guess I was sort of a sense of betrayal in some regards that they had a lot of exaggeration. And then I started following the works later on of uh, Dr. Patrick Moore, the former founder of Greenpeace and uh, and actually did work with him. I interviewed him for the Amazon. So I'd say by the late 90s, I was a committed I don't want to say anti-environmentalist, but I was someone who felt betrayed by the political environmental movement. And that's essentially how I – so from all of that, I actually didn't deal much with climate, not till touched on it briefly in the mid-90s, but really wasn't any kind of issue and hadn't really thought about it much until like 99, 2000. I interviewed Dr. Jerry Malman, uh, who's now deceased, but it was my first interview on climate. It was a hostile, contentious interview because I was asking him about the skeptics' claims. And he got very belligerent, but it was all sort of reinforcing that something's not right here. And the environmental movement has exaggerated the rainforest scares. So, there, so I went into climate as an issue, believing they were exaggerating that issue. So my long roundabout answer for you. You know, you get people like me, we sit around and we talk about folks on the other side and money all, always comes into it. Do you, so people's gut reaction is that, okay, oil and gas industry is just funneling money. So, I mean, as people would ask, are you, know, are you doing this for the money? Well, no, because 
I'm, I started as an investigative reporter covering these environmental issues. I started when I mentioned the Amazon rainforest, I believe I started that job 1997 at $35,000 a year. And I had no side income, no lucrative cash coming in, nothing happening. By the time I did the Amazon, this would have been 99, 2000. I may have been making 65,000 a year, 68,000 a year. I and mean, these are exact numbers almost. And then I was an investigative reporter for the CNS News, Cybercast News Service, and did, I went started going to the UN climate conferences. I went to Johannesburg, South Africa. I went to Montreal. I went to Argentina. It's all these different UN things. And again, I can't say I was doing anything for the money. I was—I don't, I don't think I was making more than seventy-five thousand a year. This was back in the early '00s. So then I went to the United States Senate. My salary, public record. Again, I'm not making any lucrative side deals. I have no outside income, like like uh, yeah, at that point of any kind. And I, I'm working for Cybercast News Service. And uh, I'm sorry, I go to the United States Senate. Public salary, I think I started there at like 120, which was a standard thing for communication director, nothing unusual. Stayed there for three years. I was being paid by the U.S. taxpayers, yes, working for a senator who had a lot of contributions from the oil and gas industry, but anyone from Oklahoma is not going to get around that. At any rate, I started out, yeah, I was in the United States Senate. Then I came to Climate Depot in 2009. And my salary was really a lateral move from the United States Senate, and it's still publicly available salary. It's just there is no there there. I'm making a, a lateral move from when the taxpayers pay me to when uh, Climate Depot is paying me. And I wish, as I used to work for Senator Inhofe, they'd always say, how much money do you get from oil and gas? He goes, not enough when you consider how much the other side gives. Okay, so you're not getting rich off of it. And so if you're not doing it for money, well, no, but I mean, I guess the point is that it's interesting to hear that perspective. But again, I think you were getting to this earlier about your early days as an environmentalist. So if it's not about the money, even today you're still doing this, what is your motivation? My motivation, I, I, and, and I was really deeply offended, if I can actually be offended. It's hard for me to be offended given you know the attacks I've been under. But it was Peter Sinclair who does the climate crock of the week about a month ago in May wrote something about he's interviewed me and he's assuring every, all of his readers that I don't believe a word I say and that I'm basically just a hired shill. And I mean, it's like, OK, it's funny if he tries to say that, but he's actually believes it. And I'm like, what could I have ever done to give him that impression? I actually believe everything I say. I'm passionate about it and I research it. I investigate it. I actually criticize other skeptics if they go too far. Like even, you know, I don't even like, I will never say global warming is a hoax, you know, but I will say solving global warming with UN treaties and EPA regulations, if we did face a catastrophe, that is a hoax. You know, the idea that UN can regulate. So there are aspects to that. I try to, and I even, even in language, I won't use, I try not to use the word alarmist. I try to use warmest, which I consider a more neutral term. I mean, you got to try to dial all that back, but it's a passion that I have to do this. I love reporting on environmental issues. I actually did a series of stories on wetlands, endangered species. I mentioned deforestation. So I've always been interested in environmental causes. And I sort of just, my career sort of became focused on environmental issues. And now, of course, because climate is all consuming, that's my number one issue. The Paris Agreement, this big decision that was made a couple of weeks ago, I, I'm assuming you, well, you know what? I, I want to step back a little bit. What I want to do a follow-up question is like, I guess for the record, and again, I'm not here to, to debate the science, but what would you describe your position on climate change? You just said global warming's not a hoax, but would you say that it's, I, and I, I'm just curious, like what, what are you, if you're, that's your position, is it you think there is some warming, there's no warming? I, I just so, where are you at? Okay, good question. I'll, I'll keep this very brief, but I just did a report, actually. I call it the Talking Points Report because I was so inspired by EPA Chief Scott Pruitt's poor performance, <laughs> inspired by a bad performance, uh, with uh, on Fox News Sunday with Chris Wallace back in, I guess it was April. Uh, just, yeah, I remember that. I'm putting his, you know, just not being able to handle basic questions. The ge general gist of it is this, and I've actually worked closely with these scientists, some of them almost two decades now, people like Patrick Moore and Philip Stott and, and, and Pat Michaels or Fred Singer, uh, I've known since the 90s. When I look at global warming, it's very simple to me. It's hundreds of factors influence our climate. Human CO2 is but one. Even if we face the climate catastrophe, trying to fiddle at the margins with one of those variables, i.e. the human component of CO2, and then expecting some kind of rational outcome is, as Philip Stott says and in my film, it's scientific nonsense. And is CO2 a greenhouse gas? Yes. Can CO2 warm the atmosphere? Yes. But I think it's overwhelmed by so many other factors. I think Fred Singer actually may have said it best, the physicist. He said, it, yes, CO2 is a greenhouse gas, but you can't distinguish its impact from natural climate variability, which then brings us to the whole 
whole other issue of factual. Right. Anyway, so anyway, so I look <laughs> you're, at getting, all, into you're getting into the science. You're getting into the science, but that's saying that's the kind of stuff that excites me. And so to answer your question, yes, I believe CO2 is a warming agent. And one of the favorite lines of my film, and I'll end on this. Robert Giegengack, who voted for Gore, saw his film, was appalled. He was the former chair of the University of Pennsylvania Geology Department. He actually, I asked him, does CO2, does more CO2 equal a warmer world? To ask the question that Andrew Revkin liked to ask, asked it, I guess, 10 years ago at that debate with Michael Crichton and Richard Lindzen. And, and, and Robert Giegengack says, we, I don't know. It's certainly true that more CO2, that a warmer world equals more CO2. Uh, and that's, an interesting question because I just I, I would say that CO2 is not the control knob and it's not as simple and this whole thing is a campaign cause. The United Nations bastardized the science from 1988 forward by making it a campaign cause, conflict of interest. They have to be in charge of it, of determining the science and they get to solve it as well. They have no incentive to look at it dispassionately. So. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> I got your position. The reason I just sort of want to nail it down, because as you can appreciate, even on the Republican side, there's all sorts of spectrums of it. Okay, global warming's happening. Humans might be responsible, yeah. but there's not yeah, much to Yeah, and the media, it. And the so, media Republic, when the Republican says, I believe in climate change, oh, he's different. He doesn't believe it's a hoax. But I don't know the, the human complaint. It's all these games everyone plays. What's most appalling to me are all these Trump administration cabinets who just dodge the issue, and you know they're very weak on it. Uh, Donald Trump stand on Paris. I, I, it's just so I'm so in awe of it and how amazing it was. He stood up to his own administration, his own family, to the media, to the G7, to European leaders. It was just an awing moment of presidential leadership, whether you agree or disagree, to think of all the pressure he was under. This was not a guy that got Exxon Mobil or money from big oil. He self-funded his campaign, so he wasn't in the into, he is not beholden to special interest. He was doing, I think, the overriding motivation for Donald Trump pulling out of that was his campaign pledge to coal workers in West Virginia, Ohio, Kentucky. He felt their pain, and that's why he did it. Uh, it's, and it's, a, it's an amazing thing to see. And by the way, I am such a fan. Donald Trump is probably, in my view, the greatest president of my lifetime next to Ronald Reagan's first term. I'm just I think he's doing a just the fact that he's an obstructionist standing up. And every night in the news, when I see all the right people getting upset at what he's doing or not doing. That is kind of funny. I, I don't think I ever thought I would have had a guess where they said <laughs> those things about Donald Trump. But here you are. And uh, so you pivoted to Paris. And OK, I, I sort of would predict that you're happy with the decision. But I think there's different ways of looking at, too. I, I obviously completely disagree that they should do it for, for different reasons than the science and such. But even how he did it, I mean, do you agree? It was almost sort of like a game show. Yeah. And, you know, he could have. I mean, not that I want him to convince more people, but in some ways it was so trite and so flippant that he almost made the, his decision not serious, even though there's going to be serious outcomes. So, I mean, were you perfectly happy with how he kind of handled it? No, I actually agree with you on that. No, I was not happy with how he handled it. I mean, ideally, he would have invited half a dozen skeptical scientists with credentials, uh, you know, right. people like Judith Curry, Richard Lindzen, uh, any number of scientists, at least a few, had them make a few remarks. And then he could have made some jokes about, you know, if the UN, if we actually did face a climate catastrophe, we'd all be doomed if we had to rely on the UN. I mean, I could have, I was a speechwriter uh, for the U.S. Senate. I could have written him a few great lines, but he didn't do that. And his, none of his, no one in his administration, other than Scott Pruitt, who's very, He's in a work in progress, shall we say, when he talks about the science. We'll talk about the science. So here's my holdout hope, and here's the hope for the future. I'm hoping that his science advisor, he's interviewed Dr. Will Happer, Princeton physicist, who I actually had, when I was in the U.S. Senate Environment and Public Works Committee, arranged to have him be one of our prime scientists testifying. I believe he spoke when Rajendra Pachari, the old head of the U.N., spoke at the same uh, same hearing. But he said the Earth's currently in a CO2 famine. He's about a solid a climate skeptic scientist with over 200 peer-reviewed citations, physicists from Princeton you can get. If Donald Trump were to pick him as his science czar, he would then turn that position, the way John Holden did, into a bully pulpit in many ways for, for a skeptical uh, climate view. That's what Donald Trump needs because I don't think Donald Trump – 
Scott Pruitt, uh, Rex Tillerson, or any other cabinet member should be out there challenging the science head on necessarily because it is a pitfall of nightmares. You know, we had the old Republican leader, John Boehner, started talking skeptical. He started saying things like CO2 is not a carcinogen. He meant to say CO2 wasn't a pollutant, but, he, you know, it causes him all this ridicule. Other Republicans see that. They don't want to get involved. That's why you end up with the Marco Rubio is now saying, I'm not a scientist. I have no position on it running scared. So I did this report, Talking Points, remember, I'm hoping that politicians will start looking at it. There's ways to talk about the issue articulately without getting caught up in all the traps. But ultimately, staff of senators, congressmen, presidents aren't going to like it when their their politician, their elected leader is going to be ridiculed and, and and bashed in the media. And that's the one thing Donald Trump has done so well. He's treasuring his negative notices in the mainstream media. And as a, for a Republican president, I think he's without, without peer, even beyond anything Ronald Reagan could have done in terms of that. He's truly his own man, beats to the tune of his own drummer. Sorry, I, I got, in another, well, I'm trying I got to... in another pro-Trump thing. I'm sorry about that. No, no, no. You're allowed to do that. It's just I'm sitting there going, I have to concede. I have to concede that he he won the presidency, and that was a big deal. But you I'm know, shocked. I, I don't want to get into that. <laughs> that he won. Yeah, the, the, the politics of – I mean, he's, he's not doing so hot right now, and his decision – I. Know you can agree with but back i, I don't, well, want to I don't i'm not arguing he's doing I, I when i say he's the greatest but i guess i don't mind the total gridlock and shut down of washington to me that's not a bad thing but yeah i agree with you he's not doing so hot he's not he's doing great on what he can do by himself with executive orders and things from his administration but in terms of working and getting legislation done through congress yeah i agree he's he's, he's a he's got a lot long way to go and so I want to go back to this Paris thing. I don't have you forever here. And so Trump did this on Paris, and, and you, you, you brought up, okay, science wasn't really part of it. And, of course, I think that ultimately would have blown up in his face based on what I think the science is, and I, I don't want to get into yeah. that. But he made it a decision, Donald Trump, real estate developer, and Paris, the Paris Agreement ultimately is a science issue. And people disagree maybe what that science is, but he turned it into a non-science issue and sort of the casualness of it. And so I think that in some way is going to blow back on him. But I'm just curious your thought, Randy Wade in on this based on this piece in John Oliver. John Oliver talked about the Paris, and I don't know if you actually went and saw that bit, but with tr Trump coming along, uh, this might actually be the best thing to ever happen to the climate change movement. And then Randy kind of built on that in this blog piece that he did. And I'm intrigued by this, and I'm sort of hopeful, and I'm just curious, someone in your position that, okay, the dog, you finally caught the car, the Paris Agreement, this was a really big decision in, in support of your position, and yet now, in other ways, the rest of the world or states or cities, they are now looking at climate change in such a more urgent fashion. And so do you do you see and I'm not trying to get you to argue that the Paris Agreement is a good decision, right. but do you see it could somehow backfire in the skeptic movement? Well, first of all, my no, not only will backfire, but yes, they will be unified. This will help their donations. This will help their focus. This will help cities and states build their infrastructure, the ones that are willing to go along with it, because it's going to give them pure motivation because they're going to be looking at this as, you know, we have to show leadership. You have the governor, Jerry Brown of California, making separate deals with China as though he's a head of an independent state. You have him being he's now serving as an ambassador to the U.N. Some other state appointed Jerry Brown. I mean, it's kind of funny stuff. You have the mayor of D.C. here. Mariel Bowser doing a whole day proclamation about the UN climate treaty is it's 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 all symbol the whole treaty essentially is symbolic and it's about diplomacy. The only argument you could have used to stay in would be di diplomatic reasons. There was no climate argument to make, and you can I don't know if you want to disagree with that or not, but I mean it's a symbolic treaty. What I don't understand is why people would claim that this. You know, now China's going to lead the way. Why we need a central planning UN treaty with wealth redistribution, and that's one of their stated goals is to redistribute wealth by climate policy, in order to make us technologically savvy, cutting edge. If there's that much money to be made in, in renewable energy, and it's all these billionaires and millionaires waiting to happen, as Al Gore likes to say, why not? Why doesn't someone invent a solar panel, sell it at Walmart that the American public can go buy, put on their roof, get off the grid? When that day happens, that's when coal, oil, gas fade away and we go forward. 
there's no source of shyness in Washington for spending money for subsidies, for investment in technology. You had Obama's massive, repeated green energy stimuli. The money's all been spent. I don't know why a UN treaty is so critical. Again, the only argument I would be sympathetic to and understand is for diplomatic. This is the Bill O'Reilly before he got booted from Fox was making. Donald Trump should stay in because it creates goodwill and he could use that to build up other things and the treaty's meaningless anyway. It's symbolic with no teeth and doesn't have an effect climate anyway, if you believe it. And that's a reasonable argument to make. So I don't think there's any harm that comes from leaving it. And I don't, I think it actually, in many ways, I think it shows Donald Trump's leadership. He is that Yankee cowboy that, the reckless cowboy that, in a way, that the that people feared Ronald Reagan was going to become in 1980. All the European leaders, the American left, were terrified when Reagan became president. And they're terrified now that Donald Trump is very similar. But Donald Trump's been very consistent on that. You know, he, I like the fact he went to NATO and lectured them about paying more money and about it's a changed world from all that. He's being consistent and he's really not, there's really no recklessness in it. That's an image. And he's actually standing up. The fact that he can stand up to our quote allies is phenomenal and do this decision. So it will, it will absolutely be the focal point of the other side in terms of climate lobby, if you will. And he's been a gift to them. I mean, he's, a, he's, he's, he has such, such, hatred and outrage but at the same time i think the the biggest threat to donald trump is donald well, trump I, I, agree, you know? I agree with I, that too <laughs> i agree with you <laughs> I, again i don't want to get into some of this other politics but I, you just look at his tweeting and you're just like had he not even said anything some of these problems never would have come up you're like what are you thinking yes but let's pivot away from paris so you are on the fence that you support paris agreement is that how i kind of interpret what are you I'm saying kidding here yeah, yeah, <laughs> <I'm just laughs> kidding. you're not on the you are not with paris agreement and you like the way we did it well, I wish, I wish he'd been stronger. I wish we'd withdrawn from the whole UN process that George W. H. W. Bush started in 1992 at Rio Earth Summit. There was a whole legal method where he could have withdrawn from that, and then it would have taken effect much sooner. My fear now is this this won't actually take effect until after the next presidential election. That's correct. In November 2020 is when the actual formal withdrawal. So this really was more of a signal just to, you know, symbolic signal that we're withdrawing. It's really up to the next president to determine whether we're going to stay out. And it could always be reignited pretty simply. But I was, I, I've was i been told by the legal strategists who look at this, that had he withdrawn from the original UN convention the, that was basis of the Rio Earth Summit in 1992, then it would have, which was actually ratified by the US Senate, then it would have been a huge deal to ever get back in. And that's what I, and I, and I think it's still up in the air what he's actually going to do, but that would have been a much more strong position to take. Because right now, he sort of did a pause on the treaty and it could easily be re, reinstituted, let's put it that way. If we get a President Jeb Bush, if we get a President McCain, if we had gotten a President Romney, you know, I, when I go through all the other lousy Republicans we could have ended up with, Donald Trump is looking very rose colored to any climate skeptic out there. <laughs> wow. Okay, so I don't have much time left with you. I, I, I wanted to just bring up something here is that you have been a fount of great and sometimes humorous quotes. And one of them is, I am not a climate scientist, but I play one on yeah. TV. And so I think that's where a lot of climate scientists get in trouble. I really appreciate when scientists who are good spokespeople get out there and they talk. But a lot of times they go on TV or these other me medium and they just get massacred because they just don't understand it. And I think that's where you come in and you're able to do your thing. And so I just I'm curious. They come into your playground and I, I mean, I watch you, even though I don't agree with anything that you're saying, you, you just take them to task. And have you ever considered, because you feel so strongly about this science, have you ever considered going into their playground? Do you ever submit things to scientific <laughs> journals? Do, why aren't you going to their area and demonstrating that your point has validi validity? Well, I mean, yeah, just to clarify your point, it wouldn't be me writing a scientific report, but I could work with scientists to try to get them and then and show up with like a contingent of scientists working with them as a, as a spokesman, but I'm not a scientist. But but you could write policy pieces that go in these scientific journals that have some science that you work with. There's journals that would take some of your material, even though you're not actually out there doing data. So Yes, I mean, I, I, see, yeah, I see your point on that. Yes. I don't know that I'm ne needed to do that. If you believed everything the UN claimed on science and all the countries were going to do their pledges, it would delay global warming three and a half years or something like that. I don't know that I need to be necessarily the one you know, submitting that. I mean, I don't 
because that's not really necessary for one thing. I mean, it's amazing how many scientists are out there, how many papers and sources of data you can cite. You don't necessarily need to be the one generating them. But I like your idea of taking it to their venues. And the problem is they just don't, they're not very open to anyone who doesn't, it, this has become a, Spencer Ware wrote about this, who's a climate, you know, a warmest, as you'd say, he's not a skeptic at all. But in the 1970s, he's a historian. Uh, in the 1970s, they started these big scientific conferences. Before that, I think science, in a way, they, there's a lot of good that comes from these big conferences, and then there's a lot of negative. But the good, obviously, is that scientists get together, they network, and they can advance science. The bad is you end up with a sort of form of groupthink. And I think the ultimate form of that was 1988. Once the UN panel started, they they picked all the scientists and started it. So. I don't think they're that open to having people who disagree show up, especially if you have the, the wrong opinion. People like Michael Oppenheimer and, and Michael Mann and, uh, and Kevin Trenbrith, uh, who then call for RICO statute investigations. I mean, Kevin Trenbrith, senior UN scientist, actually signed a letter calling for RICO investigations into climate skeptics and CEOs and energy companies and other scientists. That's that's so, where we're headed. But you were saying, well, and you were saying how the media ultimately reports on the science. And so I would say the same thing. How about over at Climate Depot? I mean, do you have standards when you, like you're highlighting a particular study? Do you have an, an internal process where you're like, OK, this was some guy on his blog just putting something out? I mean, do you, would you have a system? Yes, very good. That's a very good question. In fact, I actually posted a, a collection of papers from a website last week. And they actually included some papers that said CO2 was not a greenhouse gas. I was immediately alerted by one of my skeptical scientists that I work with in a very hostile email. And he copied about eight other scientists on it saying, what are you doing promoting this view? This is a discredited view. This makes you lose credibility. And I explained to him that, you know, I, I do not promote that myself and that usually I, I do not promote the view that CO2 is not a greenhouse gas, but it was included among a collection of papers. I am a clearinghouse for stuff. I, I promote the views of Joe Rose Rome uncritically from think from climate progress to also you know uh, a lot of climate skeptics who I don't actually have time to go through and check every point that they make. But what I do is the claim is particularly outlandish. I'll usually put report, claim, analysis. Everyone knows where, and I put obviously put the link to where it comes from. If I'm adopting the view myself or putting a sort of a stamp of approval on it, I do a Climate Depot report on that, and that's like my recent Talking Points report. I did a report in at the last UN conference, very similar, where I will collect the data and uh, try to you know triple verify anything, any kind of claims that I'm making. But yeah, I'm a clearinghouse, so there's going to be all sorts of it's sort of like the Wild West. I just put in a story the other day about Trump deserves to be impeached because he uh, withdrew from the Paris climate comments. I put it in uncritically with no, not even a snarky comment. So, so it's a little unfair to give me that kind of standard. I'm not promoting wacky stuff in, in general. Uh, I don't, I'm, I'm, not, I'm even featuring that wackiest stuff when it comes to actual climate data, except from the climate activist side where they'll make all sorts of outlandish claims. But, uh, you know, on the other side, it's a clearinghouse and a lot of stuff goes by and, but I, but if I'm ever going to actually promote it or adopt it as my own, it's verified and it's known to my readers and you can look at it. It's a part of a climate depot, not a link to someone else. Okay. So I, you know, I obviously disagree with a lot of news that's on there, but I wasn't accusing you of anything. I was trying to give you an opportunity to sort of say, what is that? You know, people are like, what is this stuff coming on climate depot? And do you have a system? And you explained it. So I, I want to wrap this up, but I just do want to make the point that you have dropped references to all sorts of scientific studies, like making points and stuff. And I just, I think for you, like, I think a lot of my listeners will probably be frustrated that you're you you are constantly referencing scientific studies, and yet there's a whole body of scientific studies sort of arguing the opposite point of what you're trying to make. And I, I you probably get where I'm going at. It's just the, the use the selective use of the science. It's a, it's a bit frustrating to kind of hear that because you I mean you've dropped scientific studies more than I have in this conversation, and it's just why did those rise to the level of I'm going to put faith in this study because it obviously serves a point. Well. <laughs> If you look at, you know, when you talk about dropping scientific studies, you know, citing scientific studies, if, well, if you just look at like the hottest year claim as an example, that's, you know, everyone will say that's, that's verified science. That's not in dispute. Well, I would argue, yes, it is. It, it is the hottest year if you go by their data sets. The problem is it's really within hundreds of a degree to tenths of a degree from previous hot, hottest years. It's really a fancy way of saying the global warming pause 
continues. In other words, if temperatures are uncertain to tenths of a degree, you can't claim records to hundreds to one or two tenths of a degree, which is what they've done with 2016. They did that with 2015 before, 2010, uh, even the hottest decade. It's just it's basically hyping something that is not and even, and even NASA, and the Associated Press actually has to issue a clarification after I put a lot of pressure. These are within the margin of error. Justin Gillis, New York Times, when he wrote about the hottest year, didn't even tell you the differences and he didn't include the actual data so people could know that it wasn't even, that it was within essentially the margin of error of what they, uh, of what they, what they can even adjust the data to. So, that's a claim, like you look at something like that, people think they know that, that it's certain, but it's the question of then what does that claim even mean? And it really just means that we've warmed since the end of the Little Ice Age and we've now reached a, a point where, you know, we're at a plateau of temperatures and it's, you know, hyping hundreds of a degree or margin of error just doesn't, doesn't serve anyone's interests and it's nonsense. So I spent a lot of time on that kind of settled science and I'll cite a lot of papers and data. The other thing, of course, would be the 97% consensus. You know, you had John Cook and you had other studies uh, come out with these 97% and I spent a lot of time just, I guess what you'd call uh, taking them apart. Uh, and the public will accept that as science. So many people who believe in global warming, just they feel comforted to know that 97 percent of scientists agree. And that is just a nonsense figure. One of the studies actually was only 77 anonymous scientists. We don't even know their names. But and what the questions they were asked, skeptical scientists like Roy Spencer would agree with. So just so much that people think like, oh, well, you know, all these thousands, can all these thousands of scientists be wrong? It's like it's that's not really the question. It's who is claiming that these scientists all agree and who's claiming that the data is all alarming and actually points to what the UN policy prescriptions are you know so as I said if you study butterflies you're part of that 97 percent and you might have just been doing a modeling study you did nothing wrong nothing unethical and your university's hyping well, it so it's just it's a whole thing you follow the money and the money now is promoting global warming all the funding that goes to it so of course, when you look Wait at these a studies, in terms of science, we just started this bit. We started this bit saying that the money is promoting skepticism, and you're in the pockets of big oil, and you went out of your way to explain that you're not, and so now you're kind of accusing the other side of they're producing this content no, no, based on. Let me rephrase. I'm, I'm not saying that, I'm not <laughs> saying these scientists are are, are money grubbing, greedy people. I'm saying, if you, again, just to keep it simple, the butter, the, the theoretical butterfly scientist, if you're looking at doing studies and you want to do, you know, on the the, the effect of pesticides on butterflies in the American Southwest versus you know, the effect of global warming on butterflies in the American Southwest, you're going to choose global warming. You're going to have more funding options. So that's going to put you there. Once you do that study, again, suddenly Naomi Oreskes and other researchers are going to look at it and say, oh, look, there's this scientist here. He agrees with the consensus because his paper doesn't dispute it. And this is how they build this whole case. And it's not, not, I'm not saying it's necessarily bad. I'm just saying this is where the money goes and this is where the research goes. And that's where all the funding goes. And then when you start looking at it, well, look at all these studies. Could all these scientists be wrong? It's not that they're right or wrong. They're just doing research on potential climate impacts. They're accepting a premise of temperature rise. Most, A lot of these studies have been estimated two-thirds are, mo are modeling studies when they do this, and they, when they, especially when they look at all these, you know, these but Naomi Oreskes looks at all these studies and claims that none disagree. And there's only like, I can't remember what it was, a handful of skeptical papers that challenge the consensus. Uh, first of all, there's a lot more than that. And second of all, most of these aren't it's not really about that. It's about scientists just doing studies, looking at different angles of things. Most of them are could, maybe, might, what ifs that could happen. Well, you know, I, I work with a lot of scientists that, you know, with that applied research, and I assure you that, you know, they are still figuring things out, and not too many are going to go out and st stick their necks out and say, this is definitively going to happen, or this catastrophic thing is going to happen, and even when they try to go back to the agencies that they work in, a state or city, I mean, they, they don't get much, I mean, the notion that those kind of butterfly studies, oh my gosh, we're decades away from, like, being taken seriously in a way that you're going to really take well, it's not major so much, planning action. It's not so much anyone's going to take action, it's the idea that's how you build this this myth that all scientists agree that everyone's and that that scientist becomes part of the 97 percent and i'm saying that's how they get these scientists unwittingly i mean he, he may not even have a view on whether he thinks rising he's not even qualified to say whether rising co2 would cause a climate danger point. but my point though is he's then included in the consensus because there's a scientist who did a study and he didn't dispute 
uh, any aspect of CO2. So he's suddenly part of that consensus. So you put that out and you cover it from everyone dealing with a sea level, the polar bears to um, agriculture to cow methane. I mean, there's so many different things and research grants and money go to that. So this is the science of our day in terms of where all the money's going. You have to admit, even you would have to admit, I think, that this is heavily politicized issue in the sense that yeah you know, this is where the the because of Al Gore the United Nations our political culture that's going to get a lot more funding than other similar type scientific issues not necessarily medical research or other stuff but other scientific issues like that you know people aren't going to be studying well, let's, I was just say I, I acknowledge that 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 dynamic of like funneling money to climate change but I've worked in state government federal government and I've worked with cities and nonprofits and the global warming component of it is i mean it's barely penetrated and i think the media has overplayed like how far this is sort of embedded in society and so your concerns of like all these things happening i wish it was like that i mean these groups i deal with the universe of adaptation and we just there's the assumption climate change is happening i that's what i it, think is happening and so how are we going to adapt to it and so there's it's just scratching the surface of like getting it out there so i wish we were in the world that you just described but it doesn't exist in the funding universe that I'm dealing with. Well, so. I would argue, I would do, I would leave you with this thought though. I think I'd had a conversation with Randy about this when I interviewed Michael Oppenheimer uh, of you know he used to be with the Environmental Defense Fund. He's now with Princeton. He's a UN lead author. I interviewed him for the film. He's going to be in the sequel more. He was a little bit in the first one, but I, I was struck. I went in there asking him about Barbara Streisand funding him a quarter million dollars and about you know, how he then said on Tom Brokaw interview in 2006 that skeptics are you know in the pay of fossil fuels or he implied that. I went in there about his failed predictions for the 90s and he was a very capable powerful debater interview subject it's hard for me to lay a glove on him in my interview and i i when, the thing i was struck with when i walked away from my interview with michael oppenheimer was why the hell aren't climate scientists on the other side meaning why aren't they willing to debate skeptics and in my interview with michael oppenheimer tells me that he's one of your leading lights in terms of, of actually debating I've taken you too long, but this has been a fascinating conversation for me, Mark. And one question I ask at the end of every episode is if you could recommend a guest to come on the podcast, who would it be? Good question. I would have someone like Robert Giegengack, University of Pennsylvania, the aforementioned. He's a fascinating figure. He's a skeptical scientist, but he doesn't agree with uh, the idea that uh, renewable energy will harm the poor in the developing world. He believes we should get off carbon-based fuel but not because of climate concerns, uh, for a lot of other concerns, but he doesn't think global warming is any kind of issue. He doesn't even make the top 10 environmental issues. He voted for Gore, but he was appalled after he saw the film. He's a political liberal. I think it'd be a fascinating, fascinating interview for you. And I think you'd have many areas of agreement, but he's a t solid skeptic on the science, but on everything else, he sort of agrees with the solutions from my reading of him. He'd be an interesting guest. And so you know him. Uh, I've met him. Uh, I, mean, I interviewed him and have corresponded with him. Yes, I've met him and corresponded with him for almost 10 years now. Yes. Well, I, sometimes I ask for, if it's someone that you reach out on my behalf, that's a good way to sort of make introductions. But maybe I'll follow up with you later on that. Um, but no, great suggestion. I, I'm looking for a diversity of guests. And you have probably been the most, I don't want to say controversial, but you have been the most unusual guest that I've had on the podcast. And again, I disagree with pretty much everything that you stand for. And I think people realize that, but I think people need to hear from folks like you, President Trump, those two words, President Trump, it, that happened for a reason. And I think climate change is a big part of it. And if the climate change folks want to be more effective, we have to dig deep. And, you know, those are conversations I've had with Randy. You, you so. brought up Trump again. Let me just say the, the greatest in one sentence. Trump is the ultimate middle finger to the establishment, including the GOP establishment. And, and that's why he's just, he just excites so many uh, that have just been sick of, of you know, the President Bushes and the, <laughs> and the uh, Obamas and the Clintons. I mean, this is just a it's a great alien life form that has now been been foisted upon Washington. And it's fun to watch. I just as you say, I hope he doesn't self-destruct. That's his biggest his biggest enemy is probably. Uh, himself at the moment and i get what you just said but i am not the establishment and i feel like he's a big middle finger to me so <laughs> <laughs> well said okay <laughs> uh, all right well thank you so much mark all right thank you very much sir welcome back adapters to part two of the show 
So you all heard my conversation with Mark Moreno. I have to say it was a fascinating, of course, unsettling discussion with Mark. And as I noted many times in the conversation, there's not much I agree with with him on, but we can all learn from his motivation and tactics. So in the second part of the show, I invited back on Randy Olson, who many of you know through previous episodes. Randy's the one who helped me get Mark in the first place. We are going to discuss two things, what we learned from the interview and then some action steps on what we learned from that conversation. Hey, Randy, welcome back. Uh, hey, thanks, Doug. It's always a pleasure to have you on, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation that I, I had with Mark. You know a wide spectrum of people, and that's how you got Mark on in the first place. Why did you think originally that I should bring Mark on to the podcast? Because it's important for the climate community to be listening to everything in the world, basically, and analyzing. And there's been an unfortunate tendency to simply plug your ears when climate skeptics come around, that's happened a lot. I ran into it. Uh, Ten years ago, I made a movie called Sizzle, a global warming comedy. That was my first deeper introduction to the climate community. And what I found was some places refused to even show the film. They just said there is no debate and basically ignore them and they'll go away. And that didn't work. They have not gone away. And now we have basically an anti-scientist in the White House. And it couldn't be any more urgent than it is now. And it really I find it distressing that still a lot of the climate community is not coming around to quite understanding that the enemy is now on the doorstep. Well, why I did is I was intrigued by your recommendation, and I guess I agree, too. I want to talk to different people on this podcast, and I wasn't interested in him coming on and talking about climate science, and we sort of agreed to that in person, and I wanted him to come on and just kind of let his hair down, if that's the right expression, and let people listen. And having a 45-minute conversation is much different than him being on CNN for five minutes and sort of doing his thing. And so that's why I was intrigued, and I, I was wanting him to come on. Well, this is an exercise in communication dynamics. This is not an exercise in, in information. And what we're looking at here is the style of communication that he engages in, not the substance. We're not here to talk about really the specifics and the science of what he does. And it's very, very important for people to be trying to figure out how is it that some of these folks are fairly successful. And I think the real singular piece of evidence to suggest why it's worth listening and studying the guy is last year he was in the documentary feature film Merchants of Doubt. The reason he was in there is because the director, Robbie Kenner, about three years ago, saw my movie Sizzle, got in touch with me and asked if I had any recommendations because I had interviewed Mark 10 years ago for Sizzle. And he ended up – that was my number one recommendation. Mark is an interesting character. He gets – he understands media. He's on TV a lot. I recommend you interview him. He did. And I was at a test screening where one of the people in the group said, I know I'm not supposed to think this, but I got to admit, you know, the one character in this movie I really would like to go have a beer with is Mark Morano. And most of the reviews said that about the documentary last year. In fact, Salon, which is not exactly a climate skeptic supporting outlet – uh, in their review, referred to him as the most engaging character in the film. Now, when somebody is in a pro-climate science film and they come off as the most engaging character, it's time to listen and study and figure out what's going on. It was mentioned earlier in the interview, and you've actually written about this. John Oliver did a piece talking about Donald Trump, talking about climate change and sort of what you're talking about right now. And, and I want to play that clip right now so people have that reference point. But then I want you to talk about why this is sort of an important message. So in this piece, John Oliver refers to a gassy orb. The first, he's showing a picture of the Earth. The second, it's a picture of Donald Trump. I didn't want to confuse anyone with this audio without that context. Finally, this week, the climate change movement may have gotten a symbol to rally around because apparently it was never quite enough for us to motivate ourselves out of love for this large gassy orb. But maybe, just maybe, we can now motivate ourselves to do something out of our loathing of this one. So I think that was an incredibly important, profound, albeit fun statement that he made there, because what he was saying is basically the climate movement has blown it for the past decade. Al Gore's movie sent everybody off in the wrong direction. Look at what Al Gore did in his movie, he dismissed climate skeptics in like 30 seconds. The only thing he really did with them was he cited Naomi Oreskes' paper in science where she reviewed 900 and some studies and found that zero of them were supported the climate skeptic perspective. And basically from there, he said, so let's just ignore them and they'll go away. Well, they didn't go away. That sent the wrong message. There is a debate. And this is the divide between science culture and broader American public culture. Yes, in the science world, there's no debate. But you live in a country where these broader social dynamics dictate policy, 
And that that world feels that there's a very big debate. So you can't just stick your head in the sand like a bunch of ostriches. And what John Oliver's clip, the reason that's so important, is that he was saying what the climate crowd tried to do was pursue a non-narrative pathway. Let's not engage with these opponents. Let's just go one dimensional and just spew out all this knowledge that we have. And hopefully we'll bombard people enough. Eventually they'll give in. It didn't work. Narrative is the way that we communicate. These forces of opposition are what engage people. And what he's saying now is finally you've got this singular voice of opposition. Narrative requires three forces, agreement, contradiction, and consequence. This is what's in my book from two years ago. Houston, we have a narrative. It's what we teach now in our story circles narrative training. And you need all three of those elements to communicate effectively. What the climate movement has done is never get beyond agreement. We can all agree now, and that's how Gore's movie ends. We can all agree now we've got a crisis. Let's all get to work. Well, we didn't all agree, and people still don't agree, but that's an opportunity for effective communication rather than trying to ignore it. And so that's what John Oliver is saying is, look, you've been handed a gift now with this guy in the White House. Take advantage of it. Use it to motivate people. And you've already seen it with the climate march. You know, people are fired up from that and the science march. So that's narrative at work. You need to use it and not ignore it. Well, I'm certainly guilty of it. I, I don't like giving that oxygen to the climate deniers, but I, I agree. And the, the notion of people are frustrated with giving space to people that are contrary against this climate science. And I, and I look at, you know, what John Oliver saying, it's like it, the climate skepticism has almost become a cultural movement and you can't ignore a cultural movement. This, this is bigger than just some people who are disagreeing with the science. And I don't know what necessarily all the answers are, but ignoring him, like you're saying, it, it is not it. And so digging a little bit more into Mark, he talked about his motivations and we talked about, is he doing it for the money? And I just, I thought, what were your observations on, on his motivations? Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, you know, what we want to do here is we're going to run through a, a few of these things about the interview and then want to finish by talking about things for uh, actions that I recommend. So in terms of what do we learn from this interview, three main things. Number one, that he is a true believer. He's not in this stuff for the money. Now, my message to the climate community is go ahead and dislike him all that you want. Just make sure you're disliking him for the right reasons. He is not in it for the money. Do you people understand that? I've been working with him for 10 years now, having lengthy conversations with him. He's not wealthy. He walked away from a position as the Senate spokesperson for James Henhoff that would have guaranteed him a retirement. He doesn't have that anymore as part of the gamble he's taken. There's a little tiny part of me that, that connects with him on that plane, which is that I walked away from a tenured professorship because I believe in this stuff that I'm doing on science communication. He deeply believes in this whole agenda. And what's nice in, in your discussion with him is he went into the fact that when he was 12 years old, he you know was totally fixated on Ronald Reagan. That tells you a lot that from age 12, he's been on this this direction Furthermore, a few of the things he said there were, were kind of, I think, off the mark. James Watt was a nutball. I mean, I lived through the Reagan era. James Watt was bad, but he wasn't uncharacteristic of the Reagan era. Reagan himself was pretty much of an anti-environmentalist with a lot of rhetoric that he supported. So it's not like one guy was a weirdo like that. By the way, you know, the new Supreme Court J Justice um, Gorsuch, it, his mother was the head of the EPA. She was terrible. And then Mark goes on to cite Dixie Lee Ray of all the terrible resources Dixie, I was an undergraduate at the University of Washington in the mid-70s. She was the governor of Washington. She had been a professor of marine biology, our field right there at University of Washington. She was an anti-environmentalist. She was the head of the Atomic Energy Commission. She was a nutball. So citing her as a source is really off the mark in terms of environmental credibility. So from way back when, he was headed off in that direction. And I, the conclusion I've come to from both of my movies on the attacks on evolution and the attacks on climate science is that this stuff is mostly personality driven. People are following voices that they relate to. That's largely personality driven. And you hear that when you hear him raving about Trump. You know, there's a lot of personality similarities that he feels with Trump. And he's not enthusiastic about Trump because he thinks he's going to make a lot more money. I, I honestly don't think money is a factor there at all. Number one. Number two, a whole separate side discussion is there's so much money in this climate community and the foundations, the gargantuan sums of money, over a billion dollars as of 2011, poured into this issue of climate and energy. Matt Nisbet de documented that in his climate shift report. It, it just isn't right for them to be crying poor or somehow claiming that Exxon outspends them. It just, that's just not. That's a myth. So make sure you dislike him for the right reasons. Uh, second fact about him is that he feels that he's fair minded, whether he is or not is not that relevant to the communication dynamics. What matters 
is to understand that he is a person who feels that he's fair minded. And it's true. He posts things on his, his blog that are from opposition voice, things like that. I don't know if he bottom line is fair minded or not. I don't think he really is. But what matters is knowing what he thinks of himself. That is important in understanding how this guy works. And then lastly, getting back to the his admiration of Trump. And, you know, he says it very explicitly there. And I think that is very, very relevant that he that is his hero and he's not pulling any punches on that. Yeah. And to the point of his website, Climate Depot, we discussed like what system does he have to make sure it's legitimate information? And, you know, it was an unsatisfying answer for me is that at one point he talked about some sort of standard and then at the very end he sort of tosses out he's like well i can't look at everything you know it's a clearinghouse only the stuff i put out you know he kind of looks at it with a fine-tooth comb and so yeah contradictory in 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 this information sharing that he's doing and you know his climate depot is ground zero for a lot of skeptic felt unsatisfying so randy you shared a bit of this audio with a buddy of yours who's a myers-briggs expert and he analyzed it so what did he have to say well first off you know overall his assessment is that he thinks that mark is probably an entj so i'm looking at the entj wikipedia page and this is what it says they tend to be self-driven motivating energetic assertive confident and competitive and my knee-jerk reaction is that's pretty spot on for mark it's kind of shocking isn't it i'm <laughs> very impressed that he Kind of pinpoint that he, he went on to say uh, in the notes he sent me, ENTJs know they have all the answers. There you go. He certainly seems to think that about himself. He's creative and capable of remembering and regurgitating massive amounts of data instantly. So he backs up his ideas and stuff with names and facts as stuff in a way that makes you think his insane ideas might be valid. He is a strong extrovert. So that's pretty interesting. And I think that cues me now to the second bunch of stuff that we want to go through, which is what are my recommendations to other people? First question is 10 years I've been doing stuff with Mark Morano. You know, he's in my movie 2008, did lengthy blog interview with him in 2010, had him on panel discussions for the movie. Had Last year he had me come to the premiere of his movie, Climate Hustle, and I wrote a review, as he mentions in your interview with him that Andy Revkin published on his New York Times blog, and my review was was pretty harsh. You know, I beat the thing up and said it's just not a good movie for people to go and watch. I've done all that stuff. Why is it that not one person ever in the climate community has contacted me and said, hey, you know, we're we're doing a study trying to figure out how these climate skeptics, you know, communicate, and would you join us for a conference call or something like that? Unpaid volunteer, would you just give your time? I would have. But never has anybody contacted me. So this is the stuff I don't get. Where's the strategic thinking in this entire movement? There's You've got people out there like Mark in the mass media who understands it, is beating the hell out of the climate movement, and they're not even analytically trying to strategize on how do we deal with this. We live in a media society. That's what drives our society. How can this whole movement – and the answer I can give you on that is the climate movement is heavily academic science-driven. And they're proud of themselves that they're fact-based and all sorts of stuff, and they're losing. They've passed no climate legislation. There's an anti-climate scientist in the White House now who's pulled us out of the Paris Accord. They are losing in a big way, and yet they're still clinging onto their polls saying, well, most, most Americans say they want climate action. It's not happening. So they're losing massively in the communication arena, and there's your basic problem. Okay, you've alluded to this in a previous podcast, but for the climate movement, who's the lead spokesperson? Do we even have any? Yeah, there you go. So there's the starting point problem. And th this is a problem of the entire left wing Democrats. Matter of fact, just this morning in Politico, there is an article about Chuck Schumer came out with this new singular theme for the Democrats that is the new label, uh, Better Deal. I'm not sure it's the best possible singular theme, but at least it's an effort to try and do that, which is what needs to have happen. And the article says no sooner as he announced that and a whole bunch of people say, well, it's not that simple. You know, there's all these other things. That's the bane of the entire stupid Democratic Party right now. So this is a quote that I repeat over and over again. On January 19th, in the New York Times, there's an editorial. And in there it said Democrats have been sidetracked by trying to accommodate the various needs of a diverse America and thus have failed to promote to promote a, quote, unifying narrative. That's what you need. Now, here's the sad thing for the entire climate movement. 1999, Michael Crichton gave a speech, the keynote address at the AAAS annual meeting, 
And there has never been anyone who understands science and media better than he did. Nobody ever, because he was a media giant and he had a very lengthy biomedical science background. Yes, I know at the end of his life, he went off the deep end with um, becoming a climate skeptic. I know a lot about that from people in Hollywood that I know. I know more than most people about that. But that's really an add on extra fact, because in 1999, he hadn't really dove in deep on that stuff. And he had produced all these popular things like Jurassic Park. He's the only human ever to score the triple play of media, which is he had a number one book, number one TV show and number one movie. Nobody's ever done that. Carl Sagan didn't come anywhere close to that. Number one, Carl Sagan did not have the narrative intuition that Michael Crichton had. So you had this guy with this deep amount of knowledge who gave this incredibly powerful speech at AAAS that was basically a blueprint for how to deal with the oncoming anti-science movement that emerged over the last 15 years. And it was totally ignored. You, you can read through that thing and see all the stuff that nobody picked up on. But what's, And I'm by the way, I'm in the thick right now of writing 50 new pages from my book, Don't Be Such a Scientist. It's coming out a second edition in January. And this is what I'm going to be rattling on about. And, you know, all I can do is just present these arguments and let the scientists continue to ignore it all, which is what they do. And it's tragic that that was so ignored, that speech that he gave, because there's so much problem solution dynamic in there. And one of the things he talked about is you need singular spokespersons. You need somebody who is basically anointed within the science world who can speak to one issue and be the one voice that everybody can follow. And what do you get back from the science world? Well, it's not that simple. You know, there's no one person. So what do you end up with? You end up with Bill Nye, the science guy, and Al Gore, and all these other marginal people that are more skilled at the media side than they are at the, the science side, grabbing the microphone and leading the whole thing. And more importantly, you end up with these NGOs in which they're all self-brand promoting, and so they don't coordinate for a singular message, and they're all over the map. And the net result is the whole thing is just, it gets back to the John Oliver quote. There's been a failure for the me, the entire movement to come together and synthesize a singular narrative and picking out, they could have synthesized what Trump is right now. They could have done that 10 years ago. Al Gore could have done it in his movie and said, we've got a problem here. Problem is we've got a major part of our public that is anti all the science, but he didn't do that. And they haven't really managed to bring that into focus to motivate people. Now they've got it. Now their nightmares materialized. And the question for the, the climate crowd is, at what point do you really finally acknowledge that you've got a nightmare in your hands? You know, is there something more than removing from the Paris Accord? Uh, I don't know, but that's the dilemma that they're stuck with now. Okay, Randy. So we were able to talk before this conversation, and you found a reference in the, uh, the talk I had with Mark the, about the climate control knob. Interesting. Now, so why is that? Dig into that. Yeah, that, I mean, there's these are basic communication dynamics, and you know, you need to lock onto these single, simple labels and get everybody to get behind it to use it to help focus the discussion. Mike Mann and his colleagues, to their credit, did that with the hockey stick. That gave a simple singular visual representation of a very deep and important uh, phenomenon. To some extent, uh, Bill McKibben has done a nice job with 350.org, has branded that one term, 350.org. And so you heard in this discussion, Mark taking on this issue of CO2 is not the climate control knob. Well, that's the first time I've ever heard that mentioned. That is a fundamental focal point for debate. And if the climate crowd doesn't agree with that, they should formalize that, get out there and establish it, that CO2 is, in fact, the, the major climate control knob. Now, I searched that just last night trying to because I'd never heard that before. And the only thing I really found was Brian Walsh of Time magazine wrote an editorial in 2010 about this. And here's what he says at the end. It's important to note that while CO2 may be climate's control knob, the metaphor only goes so far. CO2 isn't the only knob on the climate controls. Alterations in land use and deforestation can change the climate as well. And our understanding of exactly how different levels of atmospheric CO2 concentration will change the climate in the future is still developing. But, but there's that key narrative word, but CO2 is the main show. All right. If it's the main show, why don't you lock onto it as the main narrative? Why don't you try and formalize it as the more clearly singular narrative? Because you've got Mark arguing that it's not. So you've got a clear debate there. And this is how people advance their knowledge is through debate. When you can find two sides of an issue and resolve it, and then when you can win your side of the debate. And that's otherwise you've just got this mishmash of mountains of information that have characterized this entire issue of, of global warming. Okay, so you briefly mentioned it, and I'm sure a lot of people are going to be rolling their eyes, but why isn't anyone studying someone like Mark Morano or people like him? I, it baffles me. It absolutely baffles me. You know, 
And this isn't about my ego being hurt that I haven't been consulted. It's just a reflection of how do I sit here for 10 years doing stuff with the guy and no one ever taking an interest in that. And the answer is personality. You know, there's a lot of people in the climate crowd don't like my book. Don't be such a scientist. How dare he criticize our wonderful, heroic profession that we're all such saints out there saving the world. And a lot of them just don't want to hear my voice and talk to me. And the net result then is there's, you know, I, I could tell you a lot of things right now quantitatively in terms of how he uses narrative. I have done calculations. I can show you metrics, but I'm not going to talk about that here. And, you know, it's just there's just no thinking along these lines of strategically. And I don't know where it begins because, again, it's so heavily academically driven. It's all these people. And when they do their actual communication studies, they're supporting all these people at universities to do endless polling data and metrics and numbers and things like that and not really drawing any intuition to go out there. And last but not least, the most important quote from that speech from Crichton that, as I said, well, there's two super important quotes in it. The speech is so prescient. So the number one most important is four words. He said, scientists don't understand media. Uh, I am now 30 years into this journey of mine, and I couldn't agree more. Scientists don't understand media. And that is the stumbling block of this whole scientist-driven climate movement they don't understand, you know, they're supporting boring non-narrative movies like Al Gore's movie, thinking he's their savior, when in fact that wasn't powerful media. And they just fundamentally don't understand media. That's not me saying it. That's Michael Crichton. And he knew a hell of a lot more about this stuff than I do. The second quote in that speech that's so powerful and important is he said, the information era will be dominated by those who know how to manipulate the media. If he were alive today, he passed away in 2008, if he were around today, he would not be the least bit surprised at who's president, because where did that guy come from? He came out of the world of television, which is media. And what is media? Media is narrative. That's what it is, pretty much. You can't go on television, expect any sort of attention on television unless you've got a high narrative content, unless you're telling stuff that's got a lot of tension and conflict to it. That's what drives our society. We're a media society. And so we've got this climate movement that is utterly clueless on media. And that becomes the bottom line kind of final point of Mark Morano is that he clearly has got a, a, an understanding of media. I'm not sure that he's the most powerful and best with narrative. I could tell you a lot more about that. But regardless, he knows how to get himself involved in the media and the science world doesn't. All right, Randy. So uh, I want you to send off my listeners on a positive note. So is there a positive message that they can walk away with? A absolutely. It's one guy, Jerry Brown. I mean, you want to see leadership on the climate. There's your guy. And look at what he did that day that Trump announced the Paris Accord. Within hours, he announced two things. He was going to China and he was launching this U.S. climate alliance. That's what's needed is people single handedly stepping up and taking a lead role like that and doing things and having a plan of action where you don't sit there. Well, let's wait and see what Trump does for Paris. No, let's have a plan of action that we work on for the next couple of months so that if he goes and does something crazy like this and pulls us out of Paris, that within an hour or two, we can step up and, and immediately counter his advancing. And that's what this stuff is about, you know, advancing the narrative. So Trump advanced the narrative by saying the U.S. is pulling out of that. And Jerry Brown immediately countered it. This is all about narrative. You know, this isn't about arguing facts anymore. It's about who's going to advance the narrative. That's what he did. And I wish there were more people in the climate world that were doing that. But if you want to, if you're looking for one really solid leader, without a doubt, it's Jerry Brown. Yeah, I remember that day and those actions, and it was pretty inspiring. So on that note, thanks, Randy, for coming on. Thank you, Doug. It's always a good time on America Adapts. Excellent. Go, go surf. <laughs> Okay, so that was the episode, and now I'm back adding a new conclusion to this. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. I'm sure, like me, you were yelling in the wind when Mark would say something provocative or, or downright wrong. That said, I appreciate Mark coming on the podcast to talk about these things. It wasn't about giving him space to spread false information, although inevitably there was some of that going on. It was about why he does what he does, and it's important for us to understand this. I have followed and read Mark's stuff for years, and he's infuriated me as much as the next person but I also appreciate having a substantive conversation with him. Typically, he goes on TV and butts heads with someone for five minutes, and quite frankly, he tends to bulldoze whatever scientist that comes on in opposition, which leaves no one satisfied. 
five minute debates aren't really debates or opportunities to actually learn anything. And Randy Olson did a masterful job explaining how the climate movement can learn from this. I hope you do. In the two years since this episode came out, much has happened. Randy mentioned there aren't any real leaders in the movement. I think some people have come forward, but it remains to be seen if they are effective spokespeople. I'm likely too close to the movement to really assess what progress we're making with the broader society. There is still much of the echo chamber going on in what we do. I'm desperate to break out of that orbit. Sometimes the climate movement feels like just a highly choreographed dance, and I'm guilty of dancing my part too. We need some really creative voices to come into our space and soon. I was considering reaching out to Mark again, but didn't have time. I was wondering if he still thought so highly of President Trump. From the looks of Climate Depot, yes, he's still very happy with what's going on. Sigh. Oh yeah, I hope you enjoyed that retro episode. I will be doing that again over the next six months. There's a lot of great content in the archive, and when you're a podcast that keeps growing, newer listeners miss out on the old episodes. Okay, some travel. As I said, I'm in Boston right now recording this, so if you hear a little buzz in the background, that's probably the T going by. I'm collaborating with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology on a migration episode they are hosting. Super cool to be working with MIT. I'll be partnering with MIT's podcast, Today I Learned Climate, on a semi-joint episode. Also, I'm going to Gainesville, Florida to lead a podcast workshop at a science communication event that the University of Florida is hosting. If you're interested in learning more about how podcasting can be a tool in the communication you do, please reach out. Also, if you and your organization are interested in partnering on a specific podcast, let me know. There are so many stories to tell on this emerging issue. Let's see if we can collaborate on a future episode. Also, if you're interested in having me speak at a public or corporate event, reach out. I've been doing some keynote presentations, and they're so much fun to talk to people in person. I share stories from the podcast, but my own experience is in adaptation too. I will talk about adaptation in ways that will motivate and inspire you. You can contact me at americaadapts at gmail.com. Okay, your donation makes a huge difference. Don't forget I'm a 501c3 organization. You're providing financial support, further communicating what will be the defining issue of this and future generations adapting to climate change. You can donate at a very simple website. The link is in my show notes. You hear me talk about how you can support the podcast and what we're doing here with America Adapts. Of course, financial support is always welcome, but please also consider sharing one of your favorite episodes on your social media. Plug it with your friends, family, and colleagues. Word of mouth is the single greatest way podcasts grow. Within my show notes, you'll find all sorts of ways you can share. Don't forget to join the Facebook page and the Facebook community group. The group is private, but just search for America Adapts and ask to join, and I will approve you right away. It's a chance to hear insider info on the podcast and see what other listeners are sharing on the wall as well. Some really cool resources have popped up there. On that note, I love hearing from you. I mean it. Just say hi. If you have an idea for a guest, let me know. Seriously, it's a highlight of my week hearing from you, and sometimes it leads to really cool things. I actually here in Boston just got to meet Sarah, who's been a listener but also a collaborator in podcasts in the classroom. It was so cool meeting her in person. She listens to my episodes with some other people, and then they create these podcasts in the classroom notes. And I never got to meet her in person, so it was a real treat. We had breakfast, and it was quite lovely. Thank you so much, Sarah, for everything that you're doing. All right, to contact me, I'm at americadabs at gmail.com. Send me an email. Okay, adapters, keep up the great work. I'll see you next time.